herzlich willkommen. Ich denke, uh, wir fangen jetzt an. Welcome. Uh, I think we will start now. Uh, also, welcome to our audience online, because this is the first event we also live stream on our YouTube channel. Um, that's why I decided, for those who were yesterday, I apologize, but to repeat some of the remarks I made yesterday about the public program, The Fortress of Cross Destinies. Uh, curated by Marina Fukides, a kind of long-term collaborator of the Academy. And I would like to draw a little bit the attention to what the program is about. Um, the Fortress of Cross Destinies in Salzburg International Summer Academy's public program of talks and lecture performances for 2022. It borrows the title from the book by Italo Calvino, The Castle of Cross Destinies in which the author explores the way meaning is constructed through multiple interpretations beyond the limits of anthropocentric despotism. The castle in the original title has been altered to fortress, not only because the academy is located in the historical Hohen Salzburg fortress, which we see right behind us, um, uh, but also to instigate a paradoxical play on words and nuances. The aim is to symbolically hijack the traditional meaning of a fortress and transform its duty from guarding monocultural hegemonies towards guarding the crucial possibility of cross-fertilization and coexistence. So this is our crossing number two and it has the tarot card, the sun, because part of the book is that you basically read tarot cards. So today is the sun and literally we have the sun and we have a beautiful weather in Salzburg. So the title is Seeds Shall Set Us Free and it's a title of a work uh, we can see here behind, behind you, basically, for the audience. In the Museums Pavilion, this is one of the city galleries of the city of Salzburg um, by the artist Mune Massif, who is here with me together with Tanzim Wahab. So, and I was asked actually to give a more personal introduction to how we met instead of the usual reading CV. So that's rather improvised right now. So, um, well, Sif and I uh, met first when I went uh, first to Dhaka uh, in Bangladesh, not Dhaka in Senegal, um, in 2016 when I visited the Dhaka Art Summit, um, curated by uh, Diana Campbell uh, since 2014. And it basically is a kind of large scale exhibition that collects artists from the region. And it kind of creates a counter narrative to what we may call Western art histories. So f I was there first in 2016 and I returned in 2018 with a group of students when I was still uh, living in Singapore and teaching there. So that's when we basically engaged more also in a way in a conversation of your work. And returning in 2020, which was eventually the last trip before the pandemic, so we were literally lucky to go back uh, to Singapore because then the borders closed right after. Um, we and a group of other kind of friends and um, uh, from the region and from uh, Europe would travel to uh, Ubenik Tangai and Ubenik Tangai is basically a kind of collective farm, farming, uh, so we could say, but the interesting part is that uh, Ubenik was founded right after the foundation of Bangladesh in 1971 and it is a research center for independent agriculture. Because what we see there, what we see, what we understand, and this is also what the work is about, is how kind of global markets are a constraint to local farming, and how in this center they kind of keep and research old seeds of kind of um, plants, right? So like. You see in ginger, turmeric, rice, you see an amazing kind of amount of rice seeds I've never seen in my life before. So, and it's a very interesting place, but it is also a political place. And I think you will talk about it, and that is basically how I think I should hand over now to you both. Uh, but before I do that, I still allow myself, in a more conventional way, <laughs> to, me, uh, to introduce Tanzim Wahab which I also met there when he was still uh, the director and a curator at the Bengali Art Foundation. And he now moved to Berlin, and, uh, but still he is the director of the Mela International Festival of Photography, 
He has headed several curatorial research projects and exhibitions, including Breaking Ground, featuring works of the modernist forerunner of Bengal. Um, then a place, Displace, an exhibition about displacement, looking at the possibility of post-historical space and function as a symbolic act of discharge. Um, and currently co-editing primary documents, the Museum of Modern Arts, MoMA, a publication series on international art. And I think what is also very interesting for us here is that both have been together with, and now I need your help, Shari Dualam Shari Shari yes. uh, have been uh, appointed as the curators of the Biennale für aktuelle Fotografie, and I say it now in German, uh, in Mannheim. And this is the first non European um, curatorial team of that biennial. Uh, and I think maybe you also talk a little bit about this. Um, so, yes, welcome, Vasif, welcome, Tansim. And yeah, here you go. Thank you, Sophie. I'm good to be here. Um, Sophie already talked about personal introduction, I think, which is, I mean, for us, it's really important to have it in that way uh, because, I mean, I was suggested to read the bio of Wasif and I said, no, I can't because the bio will eventually come out through the conversations uh, and it's been a friendship. We are like, you know, we are friends, we are ally <laughs> and we are collaborated on many projects for a long time. and. And also the school we have in Bangladesh, Patshala, we'll talk about it, you know, which is also a co-organizer of the photo festival Chobi Mela. Uh, it's somehow working as a community over there. And naturally it comes up with all these relationships and this personal interaction and the form of collaboration in each of these projects, uh, which is very organic in its nature. Uh, but still, you know, I mean, I'm, I have this responsibility uh, a bit to introduce Wasif. Uh, Wasif is a uh, photographer, artist, curator, uh, and also a teacher, a faculty of Pashala and teaching in many different yeah, schools and universities uh, regularly all over. Uh, but, well, I mean, as I said, we grew up as a community for a long time where we really wanted a space uh, which is more like a multifunctional space of overlap where we have learning, we have production, uh, the partial of the school I talk about and and then slowly we also got got into uh, this process of you know producing work and sharing with each others uh, primarily and also showing it all over and the exhibitions today you are going to see there behind you uh, in these two room uh, these are actually three works combined together uh, the title of the show is the seat shall set us free a sculptural object making practice more, more towards collecting it uh, as a very important evidential approach. Uh, why this form integrates all this all together? What does it inform and what it couldn't it also uh, inform at all in a space like exhibition? Would you like to talk a little bit about these three shows, Was it? Yes. Uh, thanks, Tanzim. Uh, thanks, Sophie, and thanks everyone who is here. Um, I think it's difficult to talk about uh, form when you have an exhibition uh, in front of you. I guess you can all see um, certain kind of uh, effects and certain kind of sketches and certain kind of uh, installations there. But I will, I will come up with a story, I think, which might unfold many complex uh, things in my practice. So I started this project. Uh, of seed when I actually was working in the no man's land between Bangladesh and India with a group of artists from Brittu Art Trust. And we were doing different projects and we are looking at the idea of border. And uh, when I stumbled upon on this, um, on this little hill, um, there was a series of landscape, but now because we have to open the door, uh, you don't see all of the work. I was really interested how the industrial interventions completely change the landscapes where you can define the landscape you can define where is it uh, what you were seeing um, and when i was going up and down the field i had this deja vu feeling where i was feeling that uh, i was looking at the same thing again and again but it's not and it was just right at the border and the border of india bangladesh pakistan also comes with this 
uh, quite a uh, violent history of partition and the history of British colony, how they have left uh, India and Pakistan, how they have divided the countries based on religion. And now into more contemporary time, we also have a very uh, strong tensions between this border. But what I was interested in to really investigate this idea that how we really define border, you know, who designed these maps and how we accept them and how we how we uh, develop our relationship with this border. And from there, I have created this series of landscapes, sans landscapes which are very ambiguous. And I was also interested in scale. In general, you see this. Uh, landscapes which are quite huge in scale, but I was also interested in some form of repetition and absurdity and some form of sense of what happens when you scale down uh, a huge thing and you force the audience to get closer and look at certain minor details. And while I was walking there, um, I was also photographing certain workers who were walking there and I realized that they were all actually all farmers and they only came to work in this industrial field because there was not enough job in the agricultural field. Then I started to research, and of course, I knew this research organization called Ubinik. And I had this uh, set of questions I have researched online. And when I went there and I wanted to talk with the farmers and I asked them various questions I had, they actually looked at me and uh, they laughed and they said, uh, Why you are you asking us these difficult questions? Why don't you just open your shoe? and just come on the come on the field, uh, put your feet on the mud and just spend a few days with us and you will understand a lot of things. And when I came back that night, it actually completely struck my mind that how we actually certain times when we are grown up with a certain mo modern education system, how we define knowledge, you know, how we define our relationship with uh, different ends, you know, different vocabularies. and. Um, those farmers actually completely shifted my gaze, how I look at them. And I usually was interested to produce this light sensitive drawing, which are cyanotypes, which you only see some part of it. Uh, the bigger part of the work is not here. Uh, but while I was producing these cyanotypes, I also uh, was in discussion with a lot of different people. And um, uh, one of the people was Catherine Ware, who was curating a particular show at Pompidou at that time uh, called Cosmopolis. And um, we had several conversations, and actually Catherine also went with us when Sophie went to uh, Tangail. And um, she was um, really interested in the research process of the work. And I was, uh, I was really uh, not sure if I want to disclose the research process, you know, because as an artist, we do various sort of researches. And it's not necessarily that we share everything with the audience. Then slowly while I was talking also with farmers, I realized that the farmers believe in a certain mood of production they, when they, where they believe a multiple existence of a uh, lot of being and not being, you know, plants, uh, insects. Uh, and it's not only about human beings, it's a larger ecosystem. And from there, I started to slowly think about how I actually in, in, I can incor incorporate uh, various mood of uh, documents, images taken by researchers, farmers, artists, myself. And that's how the work, work actually got produced. And um, yeah, I think the question of form and the question of how we inform the people we work with is a complex one. Right now, I'm, I'm thinking and researching uh, I actually have to do a show for, for the farmers in the village and uh, I think the kind of work I've produced, it will not uh, actually work in the village and I actually have to produce a very different kind of form and work for the farmers to actually have a dialogue with them. So I'm completely recalibrating and rethinking about the third edition of the work. Yeah, I guess it touches a few, few issues. Uh, definitely. Um, yeah, you um, talked about research and uh, also, you know, going back to early 2000 when we formed this school and started growing as a community, uh, there was this uh, traditional documentary, uh, a reformist approach into looking into the stories, which is very close to people. And I know you have you started documenting uh, jute workers, I think 15 years ago or more? Yeah, to th 2007. In 2007, right? So it's been a while. But slowly it evolved, it changed, and as I said, you know, it somehow looks like, you know, 
based on the necessity for the research, uh, it has taken a different form. But at the same time, yesterday, last night, when Wasif and I, we were just saying, I mean, uh, what should we talk about? You know, we have, uh, we were already conversing a lot about each other's project, and it's really hard to actually have this real concrete dialogue in front of an audience. And then we came up um, organically into this conversation about the knowledge itself as, as, as a form of research because, I mean, we often say we have this uh, uh, practice, research-based based practice or practice-based research uh, both ways. But at the same time, how a certain notion of knowledge, as you say, uh, can be very reductive uh, to look into uh, the people who are on the ground practicing it, uh, and engaging with the communities for a long time, having all these challenges in this new model of nation state, but still somehow trying to f survive, sustain, and find their own way with this uh, organic agroecological practice. And, and in Bangla, you know, there is this beautiful word, shohojia, uh, which is like a fortless flamboyant way of just doing it and not saying it, you know. It's like, you know, walking the walk and not talking the talk. And was if you somehow try to work with this group of people for a long time, and and we also are discussing a lot about this, you know, colonized notion of knowledge, which has become so heavy. Uh, I mean, we talk quite often about the epistemic epistemic violence in a matter of you know always having a very rationalized, compartmentalized way of looking into research as a for form. But research is there on the ground uh, in a very intimate time and space. Um, so, yeah, how you cope with that aspect that the baggage of research, you know, when you bring in documents there, uh, but it's, it's way beyond that, right? Uh, many things are oral history, many things are told with verbs and words, with a very different multilingual practice, and it's not necessarily uh, the documents you can collect always to tell the story, especially about the seed and seed protection. This is a complex story. So how you research about seed in that sense? Yeah, that's a problem when you're talking with a friend. He knows how to ask all the difficult questions. Um, I don't know. I think it's a continuous process and it's a continuous struggle. And it's also about uh, living in the place where you're walking, waking up, smelling, uh, hearing sounds, uh, understanding silence, uh, trying to tap in a uh, lot of things that are unspoken and um, also giving yourself time to grow that's why i guess a lot of my projects sometimes it takes 10 years 15 years but uh, and you you develop different chapters and you also change your the way you you see certain things and i think one thing crucial for me um, in this in this whole project is this question of invisibility the question of trace like how you can really visualize certain things uh, that you don't see, but you feel through your gut, through your skin, through your emotions. And I think we are living in a world where uh, so many things are literally shown. We really need to step back and uh, close our eyes and uh, imagine a different planet, uh, not only as an artist, but as a human being. And um, I guess I have to always, uh, how, how, how I uh, looked at things. So the film you see um, on the on the last room is about uh, the whole jute industry, and it's about uh, machines and their relationship with human beings. But you especially see uh, what happens to a huge industry when it's closed down. When you go there, the machines are not moving, and you started to see different things. And I think for me, um, in my also in my research, the sensorial part a huge role, uh, and how we can really uh, understand uh, various things um, from uh, different perspectives, and um, and when I when I when I was working on that film, I actually. Um, film i was interested to film the whole understanding of breathing how human beings are breathing in and breathing out and if you see the film you will see there's a certain kind of movement in the machines and you will also see certain kind of movement within the human bodies and actually this analogy talks about how this whole industry is dying at the same time but it's a very poetic reflection and it's not very uh, i'm not looking for actually evidence 
um, and this whole idea of research and uh, understanding different form of knowledge is shift from uh, project to project, cases to cases and um, I don't know, I guess you always have to open and you have to accept yourself that you will be not able to understand a lot of things uh, initially and uh, you have to struggle and find for new languages. Sorry, I don't think <laughs> I have done justice to your question. No, come on. No, I, I think of course you talked about sensorial and sensorial is also political. Having said that, the kind of the another backdrop that we know we had, uh, um, Shahidul Alam, you talked about him, you know, the found, founder of Chobi Mela, Parshala, the school where we studied. And he is an activist, a curator, an artist, a writer. But um, you remember in 2018 when he was vocal uh, a about the political system, you know, the fraud of election uh, and the democratic struggle uh, to an Al Jazeera interview, he was just taken uh, to the custody from his house, you know. Uh, and, uh, and he had to stay in jail for 100 days. And then we had this free Shaidul movement, when, and then we all realized how vulnerable the situation is at the, at the moment in some particular areas to have that free expression, to deal with that sensorial aspect which totally have a political connotation and it's not so hard to decode uh, the underlying uh, political position of, you know, supporting a certain space and the people which is uh, in a verge of struggle. And we know about the jute industry and the overall situation there. I mean, recently it's not only the state-owned jute factories which are shut down, but many private ones some of my known ones are also shut down and there's a massive amount of unemployment. So the problem is much more larger happening there. Uh, but that political engagement was always there in the school, inside the school. Uh, when we uh, talk about the uh, 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 kind of platform, you know, a roof uh, where we have these uh, learning programs, you say. But for us, it's a very different alternative pedagogy. Uh, we try to question how classroom has its own confinement and the thing you do and learn is always better outside the classroom. Uh, maybe sometimes in the street in demonstration and these are also very interesting. Uh, you'll see uh, roles that an artist and author is taking in different uh, fragments in different layers of the... We had to do it because of certain reasons and also I guess um, we are living in a very, very, very uh, complex world. It's not only in Bangladesh, you know, right now in Iran, a filmmaker like Jafar Penai is in jail uh, because just he spoke out uh, in, in, in Facebook and in different forms. And in various places it's happening. And I think as an artist, we really have to rethink, recalibrate our position, how we can uh, interact and walk under such, such system. And I, I guess there is no, uh, right wrong answer uh, and I think um, Shurdul is a special person who can uh, put himself on the line and take risk um, but I guess um, different artists have to take uh, different strategies and uh, maneuver uh, um, yes and I think um, especially when you talked about uh, my early walk uh, with the jute mill workers and uh, recently I'm, I'm producing right now a new work because all the jute mills are right now closed by the government and I'm producing a new work. I just went there, um, visited the factories and um, and I guess it's an, it's an, um, it's a long term engagement uh, with the subject and I guess uh, as an artist we shifts and we, we, we have to take many roles and I think I'm still, I still, uh, uh, my practice is still hardly um, linked with this whole idea of document rather than documentary and uh, uh, archive and I think these are two very fascinating things and how we deal with this whole idea of document and archive can uh, reinterpret the histories and, and the past, present and, and future. Um, yes. Yeah. Maybe we open up. Yeah, slowly. I think we can open up. I will just slightly add, you know, I mean, this uh, shift begins with a certain, you know, concern of necessity and not I mean, the place. If you ask me, I would, I would say the place is there for as an experimental lab. You know, it works with different mediums because there was a time when 
seeing is believing was really important. Uh, uh, but uh, at, at the same time, the new generation from the schooling has talking a lot about post evidentiality and trying to see, you know, how the complex ambiguity of the political uh, narratives uh, might require um, new tries, you know, now some extensions with uh, different forms. Uh. So, yeah, I mean, but we also come down, come, come down quite often to this very holistic view of, you know, looking into schooling, learning, organizing this photo festival and your own personal solo practice. And, and there is a particular reason behind it, you know, I mean, there is, I mean, really, if you really want to talk about the space shifting of a particular place where uh, the national universities uh, don't have uh, a certain kind of mediums included in, the, in its um, um, modules, um, uh, curriculums, for an example, you know, this lens-based practice is almost invisible in the mainstream pedagogy of the universities where the school actually thought of bringing it in. But the school also started adding different practices, like we have this curatorial study program for six months. Uh, for this festival, Chobi Mela, we brought in an architect to curate the festival and to uh, reflect on the lens-based practice. So this cross-disciplinary exchanges became very organic necessity for us to grow up with. Uh, but it also makes the school quite different today from it where it started as in a place, a reformist place of, you know, uh, collecting the evidence. Um, and now also being trying to be really critical about the evidence. Uh, I don't know where we are heading towards, but um, we are believing in the cause somehow. Uh, so it will be really interesting to open this up uh, to, for you to ask questions, add your views, anything if you want to share with us. Uh, then, you know, I mean, we don't need to just make it like one way traffic, right? <laughs> so, yeah, it's up to, up to, it's over to you, anyone. feel that they also, through your interactions with them, do you feel that they also have this uh, fascination of crossing borders and knowing beyond what is there in the crowd or do, do they have like a border which they want to conserve and preserve uh, for, the, for the craft to survive and for the industries to carry on? Um, I don't know if uh, the whole question of border, the way I have spoken it's um, somehow related to them. Uh, I guess they are living in a world where it's just hard for them to to earn a living and to mm -hmm. to continue a, to continue a craft that they have learned for I don't know uh, their generations of people who have learned this crap over a hundred years and all of a sudden it disappearing and how they are going to really adjust with the new liberal economy and for them I think. Uh, their world are framed under those constraints. So I'm not sure if if they are uh, thinking of the border in the same way I'm thinking about the border. Uh, yes. You. One of, one of you said that you think that we are operating in an era of post-eventuality. Do you think you could talk more about that term? I think it's really interesting. Yeah, I'll just say, you know, we are now uh, talking quite often about post-evidentiality because, uh, I mean, you won't only see the new a generation of contemporary photographers and artists are staging a lot of moments 
uh, recreating the situations which are absolutely taboo uh, or unsafe for the documentary practitioners to reach out to and to document and that's why I'm just saying few, few forms are evolving through some necessities of the situation where you know I mean uh, I, I can give you some examples of works which are uh, focusing on political abduction uh, uh, and, and uh, extrajudicial violence in different scales but you'd see the actual form is very performative it's staged and and but still you know that it, that is being instrumentalized by the practitioner to actually touch upon that kind of issue which is not so easy to deal with in a certain time and space uh, that's one end and also when wasif was talking about this anthology this book that we developed camera in bangla uh, which is talking about also early modernist practitioners photographers of Bangladesh and I remember you know there is still this binary conversation between something being staged as a manipulation of truth versus something which is you know the actual real photographs and that conversation is still quite on in Bangladesh to look into the historical photograph and the country Bangladesh is 50 years old and in 1971 uh, we had uh, this amazing set of photographs by the Bangladeshi photographers documenting the war and there is Naibuddin Ahmed, uh, another author, a photographer who actually staged some events from uh, his ethno-nationalistic, very emotional point of view to actually take a stand for the Bangladeshis for its freedom. Uh, but still there is this notion and gesture that you know the image which has been staged to talk about the liberation of Bangladesh uh, is is a manipulation of truth and you know it lacks its evidential presence but it also talks about a very different kind of engagement of a Bangladeshi photographers documenting and photographing Bangladeshi war from a very different perspective uh, there were celebrity magnum and all of, and all the famous photographers were there all from all over the world but talking about localization in you know, the localized context it's really important to see how the local practitioners are instrumentalizing different methods not to experimentally in an artistic or art historical notion, but looking at it as a more like a, the only way out to express in a very dif different time, difficult time. Yeah. Cool. So Maybe we can go and have a drink. We have a drink, you say? <laughs> yeah, why not? I think uh, if there is no other question, then I think. Sophie, yeah, yeah, of yeah. course. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> mm. um, maybe if you, as I said in the introduction, I think it would be interesting from that experience, right? How would you describe the curatorial process to bring that to the Biennale in Mannheim? Mm. I just Mannheim think it's interesting to understand how this change of perspective, this change of perspective. Um. I think it's too early uh, to say how we will bring uh, that to Mannheim, but um, I guess um, we will uh, try to uh, uh, develop a very different kind of map of photography that uh, we have developed working in the last 20 years curating the Biennale or the festival in Bangladesh. and. We have associated with different kind of trajectories, different kind of movements, different kind of struggles, and different kind of artists. Um, and um, and through a lot of different kind of activations, which are not maybe necessarily uh, shown at the end as a form of ex exhibition, and uh, more in terms of various kind of conversations, engagements, uh, text. Um, I don't know. You like to add? I can just quickly add, you know, I mean, what we are trying to do, I mean, we are trying, this is a moment for us to see also not only the scores, but also the challenges, you know, trying to be really reasonable. Uh, we often talk about, you know, a decolonized view of being really inclusive, but we thought, you know, this is also right time for us to talk about inclusivity as such, you know, for a certain scale and form of an event in a, in a, in a photo biennale and what we mean by being inclusive and representing the global south and beyond. Uh, can we have open conversations? Uh, so very soon, I think on the 27th, if you have time, you can join in one of our first conversations with the three curators and also two curatorial advisors uh, who are joining us to have this dialogue, you know, uh, not to have a pressure to have a, a, 
propose a model or a solution, not to come to a conclusion, but to have, be really frank about, you know, the terms and the baggages of the terms we have on, you know, trying to be really inclusive, but sometimes failing to see uh, the, uh, the differences and how we cope and balance with that, how we negotiate in a space where you know i mean there are differences but at the same time we really want to be representative uh, to the world in a very difficult time i would say so yeah i mean this series of conversations for us would be much more important uh, than framing the exhibition uh, uh, in the beginning of it you know the exhibitions will become maybe the outcome of some conversations and dialogues in a, in a sense so yeah let's see how it goes yeah so that's Said. So, Sophie, would you like to continue? I think you have something to announce, right? <laughs> I think. JK. I guess that, as this, from what I was saying, sort of an open conversation, I think I won't conclude anything. But I just uh, would like to thank you both, Tansim and Nasi, uh, uh, for the conversation and the joining us, but uh, what I would like to do is uh, to announce our next week program, um, where we are kind of very happy to uh, have Basil Japanin, the director of the Visual Art Research Center from Kiev here with us in uh, Salzburg. And he will give a lecture on Tuesday called Europe, the Fortress of Crossed Wars. And, uh, that will be followed by a workshop on Wednesday afternoon. So please be invited uh, to think about the current kind of war Europe is in, uh, together with Vasil. And yes, thank you all, and I wish you a pleasant evening. Thank you.